Well, it's great to have as our uh, Henry Hazlitt Memorial Lecturer this year, Mr. David Stockman. David's a graduate of Michigan State University. He did graduate work at Harvard University. He was elected to Congress three times from the state of Michigan. And back when I first went to work for Ron Paul in the reign of Jimmy the First, uh, outside, of, outside of admiring our own boss, uh, the Ron Paul staff always admired uh, David Stockman. We got a chance to work with him on things like uh, the draft, draft registration, and, and other issues. And in fact, among the Republican staffers, he was generally considered one of the most brilliant people ever to be elected to Congress. That might seem like faint praise, but it's, it's actually not. <laughs> actually not. So obviously the uh, talent spotters for the Reagan administration had the same view. Uh, they brought him on board as director of the Office of Management and Budget. He was the youngest cabinet secretary in the 20th century when he took that job. <clears throat> now he was very unusual in that job. I would say unique in the Reagan administration and maybe unique in Republican politics at the presidential level. He actually tried to cut spending. And his opponents were people like Ed Meese, the, uh, you know, the conservatives who, <clears throat> who uh, always talked a good game, but in fact, of course, were for bigger and bigger government. Uh, when he left that job, he wrote one of the most wonderful books ever written on American politics. I think The Triumph of Politics was a bestseller, <clears throat> as I say, a very significant book, too. Uh, and in fact, I hope he'll talk to us today about the book that he's writing uh, right now about crony capitalism and the very unfortunate current American political and uh, uh, economic system. When David left the Reagan administration and finished his book, he went to work for Salomon Brothers, and then he became a founding partner of the Blackstone Group, thereby um, uh, proving the Republican staffer's view of him uh, as smart uh, some years before. He now uh, runs his own, his own uh, uh, investment bank, the Heartland uh, Industrial <laughs> Partners, um, uh, David, we're so glad to have you here. It's an honor uh, that you've flown down here, as uh, and he's donating. There's no travel expenses or uh, honorarium. He's doing this all on his own as a gift to the Mises Institute and a gift to us and everybody who'll watch this on the internet and in the future uh, on Mises.org. So please help me welcome Mr. David Stockman. Well, thank you, Lou, and uh, let me uh, start by saying, like everyone miseducated in the 1960s, I've benefited enormously from, the economic, uh, from economics in one lesson, the failure of the new economics, and all the other work of Henry Hazlitt. Um, but I have to confess that my miseducation was at Harvard Divinity School, and the subject was not economics. But I did try to get economically miseducated anyway by auditing John Kenneth Galbraith's course on economics, not knowing at the time that I was going right to the heartland of error. <laughs> anyway, it seems that his lectures were exceedingly popular, something like a thousand students would fight outside the hall to get in, but I soon learned that it was for the entertainment value. The first 30 minutes or so was, were non-stop canned jokes about the stupidity of Republicans, of businessmen, of Wall Street, of most econo uh, economists, and generally anyone who wasn't John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> <laughs> but, of but of course, I came, from, uh, I came to these lectures for the substance which followed, and that was canned too. But only later did I learn that this part of the lecture was the real joke of the thing uh, when all was said and done. <laughs> anyway, uh, I escaped Harvard not being miseducated in economics. I went to work on Capitol Hill. I worked for a moderate Republican. We were allowed to read Newsweek in that office. And as a result, I became educated directly for the first time by Henry Hazlitt's uh, columns week after week. And so it really is a great honor to try to uh, give a lecture today that may uh, update and incorporate and apply to the circumstances of the moment some of the enormous uh, wisdom uh, 
and fundamentally correct economics that he wrote about and stood for for so long. So I would start today by saying the triumph of crony capitalism occurred on October 3rd, 2008. The event was the enactment of TARP, the single greatest economic policy abomination since the 1930s, or perhaps ever. Like most other quantum leaps in status intervention, the Wall Street bailout was justified as a last resort exercise in breaking the rules to save the system. In the immortal words of George W. Bush, our most economically befuddled president <laughs> since FDR, I've abandoned free market principles in order to save the free market system. Now, I've checked that out several times, and he did say that, just in case uh, anyone thinks I'm uh, exaggerating. Based on the panicked advice of Paulson and Bernanke, of course, the president had the misapprehension that without a bailout, quote, this sucker is going down, unquote. Yet 30 months after the fact, Evidence that the American economy had been on the edge of a nuclear-style meltdown is nowhere to be found. In fact, the only real difference with Iraq is that in the campaign against Saddam, we found no weapons of mass destruction. By contrast, in the campaign to save the economy, we actually used them, or at least uh, their economic equivalent. <clears throat> Still, the urban legend persists that in September 2008, this payment system was on the cusp of crashing and that absent the bailouts, companies would have missed payrolls, ATMs would have gone dark, and general financial di disintegration would have ensued. But the only thing that even faintly hints at this fiction is the commercial paper market dislocation that occurred at the time. Upon examination, however, it is evident that what actually evaporated in this sector was not the cash needed for payrolls, but billions in phony book profits which banks had previously obtained through yield curve arbitrages, which were now violently unwinding. At the time, the commercial paper market was about two trillion and was heavily owned by institutional money market funds including First Reserve, which was the granddaddy, with about 60 billion in footings. Most of this was rock solid, but its portfolio also included a moderate batch of Lehman commercial paper, a performance enhancer, I guess you might call it, designed to garner a few extra bips of yield. As it happened, this foolish exposure to a de facto hedge fund, which was leveraged 30 to one, resulted in the humiliating disclosure that First Reserve broke the buck and that the somnolent institutional fund managers who were its clients would suffer a loss, all of 3%. Well, that, shouldn't have, that should have been a so what moment, except then all of the other lemming institutions who were actually paying fees to money market funds for the privilege of getting return-free risk decided to panic and demand redemption of their deposits. This further step in the chain reaction basically meant that some maturing commercial paper would not be rolled over due to money market redemptions. But this outcome too was a so what. Nowhere was it written that GE Capital or Bank, One, uh, Bank One's credit card conduit to pick two heavy users of this space had a federal entitlement to cheap commercial paper so that they could earn fat spreads on their loan books. Regardless, the nation's number one crony capitalist, Jeff Imelt of GE, jumped on the phone to Secretary Paulson and yelled fire. Soon, the Fed and the FIDIC stopped the commercial paper on wine dead in its tracks by essentially nationalizing the entire market. Even a cursory look at the data, however, shows that IMELT's SOS call was a self-serving crock. First, about one trillion of the two trillion in outstanding commercial paper was of the so-called ABCP type, asset-backed commercial paper. Paper backed by packages of consumer loans, such as credit cards, auto loans, and student loans. 
The ABCP issuers were off-balance sheet conduits of commercial banks and finance companies. The latter originated the primary loans and then scalped profits up front by selling these loan packages to their own conduits. In short, had every single ABCP conduit, and there was a trillion, been liquidated for want of commercial paper funding in the fall of 2008, and over the past three years most have been, not a single consumer would have been denied a credit card authorization or a car loan. His or her bank would have merely booked the loan as an on-balance sheet asset rather than an off-balance sheet asset. The only noticeable difference on the entire financial planet would have been that a few banks wouldn't have been able to scalp profits from on-season loans. In this instance, it appears that President George W. Bush did, in fact, bomb the village to save it. Another $400 billion of the sector was industrial company CP, the kind of facility that some blue chip companies did use to fund their payroll. But there was not a single industrial company in America then issuing commercial paper, which did not also have a standby bank line behind its CP program. Moreover, since these companies had been paying a 15 or 20 basis point standby fee for years, their banks had a contractual obligation to fund these backup lines and none refused. In short, there never was a chance that payrolls wouldn't be met. The last 600 billion of CP is where the real crony capitalist stench lies. There were two huge users of the finance company CP sector, this last 600 billion, GMAC and GE Capital. At the time of the crisis, GE Capital had asset footings of 600 billion, most of which were long-term, highly illiquid, and sometimes sketchy corporate and commercial real estate loans. In violation of every rule of sound banking, more than 80 billion of these positions were funded in the super cheap commercial paper market. This maneuver, of course, produced fat spreads on GE, GE's loan book and big management bonuses too. But it also raised to a whole new level the ancient banking folly of mismatching short and hot liabilities with long and slow assets. Under free market rules, an inability to roll 80 billion in CP would have forced GE Capital into a fire sale of illiquid loan assets at deep discounts, thereby incurring heavy losses and a reversal of its prior phony profits. Or in the alternative, it could have held the loan book and issued massively dilutive amounts of common stock or subordinated debt to close its sudden funding gap. Either way, GE shareholders would have taken the beating they deserved for overvaluing the company's true earnings and for putting reckless managers in charge of the store. So my point is that the financial meltdown during those eventful weeks was not triggered by the financial equivalent of a comet from deep space, but resulted from leveraged speculation that should have been punishable by ordinary market rules. Viewed uh, very broadly, or more broadly, the carnage on Wall Street in September 2008 was the inevitable crash from a 40-year financial bubble spawned by the Fed after Nixon closed the gold window in August 1971. As time passed, the Fed's market rigging and money printing actions had become increasingly destructive, leaving the banking system ever more unstable and populated with a growing bevy of too big to fail institutions. The 1984 rescue of continental Illinois, the 1994 Mexican uh, peso crisis bailouts, the Fed's 1998 life support operation for long-term capital were all just steps along the way to September 2008. Then, at that point, faced with the collapse of its own handiwork, Washington panicked and joined the Fed in unleashing an indiscriminate bailout capitalism that has now thoroughly corrupted the halls of government, even as it has become a, de a debilitating blight on the free market. So in this context, a context, the linkage between printing press money 
and fiscal profligacy merit special attention. Now there are no fiscal rules at all. And already we have had cash for clunkers, cash for caulkers, and under the homeowner's credit, cash for convicts. Because it <laughs> seems like two or 3,000 people filed uh, who uh, didn't really need a home uh, at the moment. In any event, my belief is that the subprime meltdown was only a warm-up. The real financial widowmaker of the present era is likely to be U.S. government debt itself. The sheer budgetary facts are bracing enough. It needs to be recalled that fiscal year 211, now underway, will encompass not a recession bottom, but the sixth through the ninth quarter of recovery. During this interval of purported uh, rebound, however, the White House now projects red ink of 1.645 trillion. This means that 43 cents on every dollar will be borrowed, every dollar spent will be borrowed, thereby generating a financing requirement just shy of 11% of national income. These elephantine figures mark a big lurch southward since the deficit, deficits only half this size were expected for the current year as recently as last spring. Notwithstanding, a full year of green shoots and booming stocks, however, Washington embraced a monumental round of new fiscal stimulus in December, as you all recall. The result was a trillion dollar Christmas tree festooned with fiscal largesse for every citizen, inclusive of the quick as well as the dead. Moreover, uh, moreover uh, this bounty was extended without prejudice to each and every social class, with workers, the unemployed, the middle class, the merely rich, and billionaires too getting a share. It would be foolish in the extreme to dismiss this budgetary eruption as a fit of transient exuberance, even if by the president's own admission, the White House was in a shellacked state of mind and in no position to restrain December's bipartisan stampede. In fact, the United States is clocking a 10% of GDP deficit for the third year running because this latest fling of budgetary excess is just another episode in the epical collapse of U.S. financial discipline that began 40 years ago at Camp David. That the demise of the gold standard should have been as destructive of fiscal discipline as it was of monetary probity can hardly be gainsaid. Under the ancient regime of fixed exchange rates and currency convertibility, fiscal deficits without tears simply were not sustainable no matter what errant economic doctrines lawmakers got into their heads. Back then, the machinery of honest money could be relied upon to trump bad policy. Thus, if budget deficits were monetized by the central bank, this weakened the currency and caused a damaging external drain of monetary reserves. And if the deficits were financed out of savings, interest rates were pushed up, thereby crowding out private domestic investment. Politicians did not have to be deeply schooled in Bastiat's uh, parable of the seen and the unseen. The bitter fruits of chronic deficit finance were all too visible and immediate. But during the four decades since the gold window was closed, the rules of the fiscal game have been profoundly altered, specifically under Professor Friedman's contraption of floating paper money Foreigners may accumulate dollar claims or exchange them for other paper money. But there can never be a drain on U.S. monetary reserves because dollar claims are not convertible. The infernal engine of the fiat dollar, therefore, has had numerable, numerous lamentable consequences, but among the worst is that it facilitated open-ended monetization of the U.S. government's debt. Now, monetization, as I'm sure you all know, can be done in two ways. First, there is outright monetization, as is now being conducted by the Fed through its POMO program, that is, its daily purchase of four to eight billion of Treasury debt. Indeed, the Fed's QE2 bond purchases, purchases of late have been so massive that it is literally buying Treasury paper in the secondary market almost as fast as new bonds are being issued. 
During January, for example, fully 40% of the Fed's 100 billion bond buy was from QCIP numbers, or that series of bonds, that were less than 90 days old. Needless to say, putting brand new treasury bonds in the Fed's vault before they've paid even a single coupon is functionally equivalent to printing greenbacks. After all, under this type of high-speed round trip, virtually all the coupons from newly issued bonds will end up as incremental profit at the Fed and be remitted back to the Treasury at year end, hence the money never leaves. Stated differently, in the present era of massive quantitative easing, newly issued Treasury securities amount to non-interest bearing currency without the circulation privilege. But over the last several decades, the preferred course has been indirect monetization. That is, the world's legion of willing mercantilist exporters from China to the Persian Gulf have printed their own money in vast quantities, ostensibly to peg their exchange rates, but with the effect of absorbing trillions of US Treasury paper. To be sure, the people's money warehouse in China and those in uh, other mercantilist lands are pleased to label these accumulations as sovereign wealth portfolios. But the fact is, these hordes of sequestered dollars are not classic, classic monetary reserves derived from a true sustainable surplus on current account. Instead, they are simply the book entry offset to the inflated local money supplies that have been emitted by this global convoy of peggers, that is, the mercantilist nation central banks tethered to the Fed. That this convoy is a potent mechanism for monetizing the US debt is readily evident by way of contrast with classic monetary systems anchored on a true reserve asset. At the peak of its glory before the guns of August 1914 laid it low, the sterling-based gold standard operated smoothly with a London gold reserve amounting to 1 to 2 percent of British GDP. Likewise, in 1959, at the peak of Bretton Woods, the U.S. held 20 billion of gold reserves against GDP of 500 billion. Again, at about 4 percent of GDP, the hard monetary reserves needed to operate the system were extremely modest. Now, the reason for parsimonious reserve quantities under the gold standard was the fact of continuous settlement of trade accounts via the flow of monetary assets. In the case of a balance of payments deficit, for example, the outflow of reserve assets directly and immediately contracted or contracted domestic money markets and banking systems, setting in motion an automatic downward adjustment of domestic wages, prices, and demand, and encouraging an upward move in exports and domestic production. In the case of surplus countries, the adjustments were in the opposite direction. Most importantly, with real economies constantly in adjustment, central bank balance sheets stayed lean and mean. By contrast, under the contraption that Professor Friedman inspired, trade account balances are never settled. They just grow and grow and grow until one day they become the object of fruitless jabbering at a photo op society called G20. <laughs> uh, in all fairness, Professor Friedman did not envision a world of rampant dirty floating. Indeed, it would have taken a powerful imagination to foresee four decades ago that China would accumulate three trillion of foreign currency claims or more than 50% of its GDP, and then insist over a period of years and decades that it did not manipulate its, its exchange rate. Still today, there can be little doubt that China and other mercantilist exporters operate massive monetary warehouses where they deposit treasury bonds acquired during their endless dollar buying campaigns. Moreover, the U.S. Treasury Department can now stop splitting hairs about whether China is a reserve or is a currency manipulator because China just admitted it. Recently, the Vice Chairman of the People's Bank of China, 
Yi Gang asked, a uh, good question, why do we have so much base money, he wondered. Said Mr. Yi, answering his own question, quote, the central bank buys up foreign exchange inflows. If it didn't, the yuan wouldn't be so stable. Hmm. Nowhere now, I would say, there's one for the Guinness Book of Understatements, uh, <laughs> if I ever saw one. So at the end of the day, American lawmakers have been freed of the classic uh, monetary constraints. There is no monetary squeeze, and there is no reserve asset drain. The Fed always supplies reserves to the banking system to fund any and all private credit demand at policy rates that are invariably low. The notion of fiscal, quote, crowding out thus belongs to the Museum of Monetary History. At the same time, the seemingly limitless emission of dollar claims by the U.S. Central Bank results not in a contractionary drain of monetary reserves from the domestic banking system, but in an expansion, in, but in an expansionary accumulation of these claims in the vaults of central banks. In less polite language, a growing portion of the federal debt has ended up in what amounts to a global chain of monetary roach motels, places where treasury bonds go in, but they never come out. Um, <laughs> In fact, foreign central banks hold 2.6 trillion of U.S. treasuries at the New York Fed, while the Fed itself owns 1.2 trillion of treasury debt. Add in at least a half trillion more treasury paper that is officially held elsewhere, and you have the startling fact that about 4.5 trillion, or 50% of all the publicly held federal debt ever issued has now been sequestered by central bankers. With such a mighty bid from the world's central bankers, we have thus experienced what our classically trained forebears held to be impossible, a prolonged era of fiscal deficits without tears. To be sure, it took American politicians a decade or so to realize that the old rules were no longer operative, Helped immeasurably by the collapse of the Soviet war machine, Orthodox Senate Republicans and Bourbon Democrats achieved for a fleeting moment the appearance of fiscal balance at the turn of the century. But it was not long before the cat was out of the bag. In making the case for the Bush tax cuts of 201, then Vice President Cheney summed up the new reality, postulating that, quote, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. He proved nothing, uh, he proved no such thing, of course, but Republican politicians of the George W. Bush era, era had most assuredly discovered that they could borrow with relative impunity. Soon the GOP transformed the policy-based idea of lower marginal income tax rates from the Reagan era into a faith-based religion of tax cutting anywhere, anytime, for any reason. So intense was the reawakening that the floor of the U.S. House became thronged with fiscal holy rollers, throbbing and shaking and jerking and gesticulating <laughs> as, they exercise, as they exercised section after section of the Revenue Code. By the time Bush and the Congressional Republicans were through in fiscal 209, the revenue had been reduced to 14.9% of GDP, the lowest level since 1950, and far below the 18.4% level extant when Ronald Reagan left office. To be sure, lowering the, tax, lowering the burden of taxation on the American economy is a compelling idea from both a philosophical and an economic policy viewpoint. But deficit finance tax cuts are a politician's snare and delusion. Such fiscal actions do not actually reduce tax payments, they just defer the timing. Moreover, the evidence of the last 30 years shows that preemptive tax cuts don't actually, quote, starve the beast, notwithstanding the popularity of this nostrum among certain K Street philosophers whose day job involves panhandling outside the Ways and Means Committee hearing room. <laughs> uh, indeed, even as the tax-cutting branch of the GOP 
busied itself giving every organized constituency in America some kind of special break, including incentives to Iowa pig farmers to distill motor moonshine that they were pleased to call ethanol, the dual fiscal burden of the American welfare state and warfare state were getting heavier, not lighter. Here, the GOP's neocon war department and its domestic porker division were busy, too, pushing federal spending to the federal spending to GDP ratio to record levels. In this respect, the neocons deserve a special chapter in the annals of fiscal infamy. Having pushed the American empire to take its stand on real estate of dubious merit historically, that is, the bloody plains of the Tigris Euphrates and the desolate expanse of the Hindu Kush, they persisted for the better part of the decade in refusing to finance with honest taxation wars which they could not win and would not end. The cumulative tab for Iraq, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan now stands at 1.26 trillion. And therein lies, the stark, therein lies a stark tribute to the efficacy with which Professor Friedman's contraption absorbs the federal debt. The fact is, America's conservative party, so-called, did not even break a sweat as it debt financed what were surely two of the most elective foreign policy misadventures ever undertaken. Again, the contrast with canons of classical finance helps crystallize the picture. Writing in 1924, Hart Hartley Withers, eminent editor of The Economist and keeper of Badgett's wisdom on matters of money and central banking, lamented that British finances were in shambles because the government had broken all the rules of proper war finance during its battle with the Hun. Rather than obtaining at least 50% of its revenue from current taxation and the balance from the people's savings at an honest wage for capital, it had resorted to massive inflation of bank credit and issuance of paper money, shin plasters as they were known then, to pay His Majesty's bills. Withers took special aim at England's first war chancellor, Lloyd George, thundering as follows, quote, it is difficult to exaggerate the evil effects of the economic crime, and he said, economic crime, that he committed when in the spring of 1915, he imposed no taxation whatever to meet the massive deficit which faced him. So at the zenith of the monetary golden age, sound opinion held that it was an economic crime to run the printing presses even when a million enemy soldiers were bivouacked across the channel. Now, a hundred years later, monetizing the expense of pursuing a tall man and a hundred followers lost in the high Himalayas apparently doesn't even rank as a misdemeanor. Uh, that's how far we've come. It was in the domestic spending arena, however, where the newly liberated Bush Republicans put the pedal to the metal. During the Reagan era, there had been a modicum of progress in throttling the domestic welfare state, with domestic spending dropping to 13.4% of GDP after having averaged 15.2% of GDP during the Carter years. Moreover, after the next uh, decade of divided government in the 90s, the size of the domestic welfare state had drifted upward, but only a touch, clocking in at 13.5% of GDP by fiscal year 2000. The frightening thing about the American fiscal future lays in what happened next, with Republican control of both houses of Congress and the White House for six full years. Now, apologists such as Newt Gingrich had excused Reagan's mega deficits on the grounds that conservatives were not obligated to serve as tax collectors for the welfare state. And fair enough. With divided government during Reagan's entire eight years, the political horsepower simply didn't exist to take on the three core entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. By fiscal 2000, however, the big three entitlements alone cost $740 billion, or 7.5% of GDP. The time for fundamental reform is long overdue, but a Republican policy offensive against the fiscal heartland 
of the American welfare state never came. Instead, Medicaid was actually expanded moderately at the behest of Republican governors. Medicare spending was swollen by a huge new entitlement benefit for pre prescription drugs, courtesy of Big Pharma. And Social Security rolled along without even a sideways glance from the anti-spenders. Consequently, outlays for the big three entitlements doubled to 1.425 trillion, or 10.1 percent of GDP in Bush's final budget, thus upping the fiscal burden by one third in only eight years. But wait, as the late night commercial admonishes, there's more. Uh, in that most, in that modest 15% corner of the federal budget known as domestic discretionary spending, Bush-era Republicans went on a veritable rampage. Homeland Security spending, for example, soared five-fold from $13 billion in 2000 to $59 billion in 2009. Likewise, uh, likewise, outlays for veterans programs rose from $47 billion in 2000 to nearly $100 billion by 2009. Next, there is the one President Reagan tried to abolish, the Department of Education. Steaming in the opposite direction, the Bush Republicans doubled it from 33 billion to 66 billion. While they touted this education spending explosion as evidence of, quote, compassionate conservatism, the more apt characterization is that once Republicans embraced yet another function for the American welfare state, they saw to it that no education lobby group would ever be left behind. That's evident in the numbers. During the same eight years, housing and community development spending also doubled to 60 billion along with a 75% rise in transportation, a swelling of farm support programs, and enactment of a 60 billion energy bill providing subsidies for solar, wind, fuel cells, clean coal, fusion, ethanol. The exact menu Republicans once held could best be sorted out by the free market. In all, domestic spending during fiscal 2008 came in at a record 2.3 trillion. After 30 years of, of a rolling referendum on the welfare state, then the verdict was clear. Eight years of Republican government had brought the burden of domestic spending to 15.8% of national income, a figure materially higher than the average during the last period of unified democratic government under Carter. Thus, while the impact of the Reagan revolution on the size of the US government has always been immeasurably modest, it was now totally erased. The sorry Republican record on fiscal matters is not merely a, mortali a morality tale. When the conservative party and democracy embraces starve the beast on taxing and feed the beast on spending, then fiscal governance breaks down badly. You end up with two free lunch parties competing for the affections of the electorate, alternately depleting the revenue base and then pumping up the spending. Needless to say, this outcome bespeaks irony. Milton Friedman was an unrelenting foe of big government and the American welfare state, yet the global monetary contraption he inspired ensured its perpetuation. Consider, for example, how the two-party free lunch competition has perverted the basic budgeting process. Here, the basic tool of long-term fiscal policy, the so-called 10-year budget projection, has been utterly corrupted by the need of both parties to disguise the full measure of their profligacy. The most recent CBO baseline, for example, shows the federal deficit declining from 11% of GDP this year to 3% by 215, a trend which looks like progress. Unfortunately, this baseline outlook is now useless as it is riddled with fiscal booby traps, as I call them, in the form of major costly entitlement and tax law provisions that expire in an arbitrary, cliffwise fashion one, two, or three years down the road. It is widely known, of course, that the Bush income tax rate cuts expire promptly at midnight on December 31, 2012, causing a $200 billion per year pickup in the revenue baseline there, uh, thereafter, at least in the projections. But what also happens on January 1, 2012, is that the $100 billion abatement of payroll taxes abruptly expires, and so does the so-called AMT patch, 
The latter means that the number of taxpayers facing the alternate, uh, alternate minimum tax jumps from 4 million to 33 million, causing the projected annual revenue take to rise from 34 billion under the patch, temporary, to 129 billion permanent. Likewise, the 15% tax rate in corporate dividends will jump to 40% in 213. The estate tax goes back up. All the tax credits that are now in place expire and so forth. Taken together, the December Christmas tree contained temporary tax provisions worth 3.8% of GDP, the equivalent of $650 billion annually that will have completely expired by 214. The resulting big uptick in revenue seems antiseptic enough when viewed on the computer screen. However, were these provisions to expire in real life, upwards of 100 million different taxpayers would take a hit. Consequently, most of these tax breaks won't expire. Their due date will just be kicked down the road a couple of years as part of the annual, quote, rinse and repeat exercise <laughs> which now passes for budget making. The picture is not much different on the spending side. Something called the dock fix has been enacted repeatedly, a measure which temporarily waives the 20% drop in Medicare fees built into current law. Now, upon passage, the politicians collect their election year medications from the grateful physician's lobby while taking credit for a 30 billion future annual spending reduction when the waiver expires but of course, it won't. Likewise, under extended unemployment benefits, 10 million workers get various, quote, extended tiers of the unemployment insurance program at an annual cost of 150 billion. But under current law, nearly two thirds of this cost is deemed temporary, meaning that out year budget projections only show 50 billion of annual expense. The reality, however, is that to avoid a cold turkey shock, Congress has repeatedly voted extensions at the 11th hour and will again in 2012. Going forward, there can be little doubt that the GOP is determined to forestall nearly all of the tax law expirations currently scheduled, including the rate cuts, capital gains, estate tax, dividends, business credits, and so forth. This means that baseline revenue is only about 16 to 17% of GDP according to current Republican policy doctrine. At the same time, when you remove the spending expiration booby traps, it appears that current policy for outlays as advocated by the Democrats, and most of the Republicans too, is about 24% of GDP. So if you go by the math of it, the current bipartisan policy path results in a permanent fiscal deficit of seven to 8% of GDP. Now that would amount to about seven trillion in new bond issuance over the next five years alone and take the total public debt in the United States to over 100% of GDP. There is no telling, of course, as to how much more of Uncle Sam's debt the monetary roach motels of the world can ultimately absorb. But since American politicians no longer fear deficits because they have been successfully monetized for decades now, we will surely put the matter to the test. There is one powerful factor, however, suggesting that the man with his the end is near sign may show up any day now. Specifically, the aforementioned 1.5 trillion per year of current policy deficits, as far as the eye can see, assumes that we are having a Keynesian moment, not an Austrian one. The new White House budget, for example, postulates that the Keynesian medication has worked like a charm. Thus, there will be no recession for the next 10 years, although we have averaged one every 4.3 years since 1947. It also assumes that real GDP growth will average 3.2% over the next decade, or double the 1.7% average during the past decade. Finally, it projects the US economy will generate 20 million new jobs during the coming decade, compared to only 1.7 million during the last 10 years. As the man with the sign also said, good luck with that. <laughs> in, any event, uh, in any event, the already uh, ba uh, baleful deficit projections would grow by trillions more under plausible economic assumptions. 
But the more crucial point is that the dead hand of Richard Nixon keeps showing up on the fiscal playing field. Echoing Tricky Dick, today's GOP has once again embraced the Keynesian faith, even if it has been robed in the ideological vestments of the prosperous classes. That is, in a preference to ameliorate cyclical, cyclical weakness with tax cut stimulants rather than spending sprees. But notwithstanding choice of stimulants, Republicans too believe that the US economy is in a conventional business cycle and that the rebound remains much too fragile to tolerate any jarring fiscal actions. Thus, the renascent Keynesian consensus will result in kicking the fiscal can down the road again, again, and again. It is here that the true fiscal nightmare arises owing to, the, owing to the possibility that this mainstream outlook is completely erroneous and that the nation's deep economic ills are rooted in the massive excess debt burden accumulated on the U.S. balance sheet after 1971. In that event, we would be in the midst of an Austrian debt deflation, not a Keynesian cyclical rebound. From a fiscal perspective, a prolonged debt deflation would be the coup de grace. That's because debt deflations crush nominal GDP growth owing to the evaporation of credit-fueled additions to spending. In turn, lower nominal GDP growth is bad news for revenues because what we tax, obviously, is money incomes. Moreover, the actual GDP data suggests that debt deflation is already resident in the numbers. Total U.S. credit market debt essentially stopped growing in late 2007 at a level slightly above 50 trillion compared to 14.3 trillion of GDP. During the three years since late 2007, total debt growth has been a tepid 1.5% annual rate with public debt growing much faster than this and financial and household sector liabilities actually shrinking. Not surprisingly, nominal or money GDP growth has gained only $530 billion during the 36 months since the peak, meaning that the annualized growth rate has only been 1.2%. There is no three-year streak that anemic anywhere in the data since the 1930s. Moreover, even if you allow for the alleged rebound since Q2 2009, June 2009, the rate of money GDP growth has been only 3.8%, and was actually just 3.2% in the most recent quarter. By contrast, the new White House budget projects money GDP growth of 5.6% per annum over the next five years, meaning that nominal GDP would reach 20 trillion by that latter date. At a 3.5% lower rate, however, which has tripled the growth rate of the last three years and in line with the post-June uh, 2009 rate of advance, Money GDP would come in at only 18 trillion by 2016. Now this two trillion variance might be written off to wild blue speculation. Then again, at the current marginal federal tax yield, the implied revenue shortfall of 400 billion annually. Stated differently, the current policy deficit may actually be in the two trillion range after factoring in realistic incomes and revenues. The infernal engine of the dollar may thus have been doubly diabolical on the fiscal front. First, it hooked the American political system on the deficits don't matter theorem by eliminating the economic, economically painful squeezes and drains on the monetary system that traditionally accompanied fiscal deficits. Secondly, to the extent that it fueled a debt supercycle that swelled from 1980 until 2008, it generated a false prosperity and a bubble-derived fiscal windf windfalls that have now evaporated. Shortly after Nixon closed the gold window in August 1971, Secretary Connolly, many of you recall him, <laughs> famously told an assemblage of foreign central bankers that, quote, the dollar is our currency but it's your problem. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, of course, the esteemed secretary had studied 
at the Wright-Patman School of Texas Finance, of course, and not the University of Chicago. But he nevertheless shared with Professor Friedman, shared Professor Friedman's assurance that floating the dollar would eliminate the nettlesome problem of the U.S. current account deficit. That is, such trade adjustments as might be needed would be done by non-dollar speakers in the global economy. History now says otherwise, and resoundingly so. Indeed, once relieved of the immediate pain of self-correcting contractionary drains on our domestic money markets and banking systems, the U.S. was free to go on a monumental borrowing spree dominated, denominated in the world's reserve currency. At the same time, there, there emerged up and down the East Asian main rulers enamored with a development model amounting to export mercantilism. This scheme produced a plenitude of factory jobs and social quietude internally while ge generating massive external dis uh, surpluses that could be recycled uh, into vendor financing for ever-expanding export volumes. The resulting mutant symbiosis between the American economy and the East Asian mercantilist exporters spawned a long-term outcome that Milton Friedman held to be impossible under floating exchange rates. Namely, 33 consecutive years of deep current account deficits at 3 to 5% of GDP, external deficits which now have accumulated to more than $7 trillion since the late 1970s. Now the fly in the theoretical ointment, of course, is that by pegging their currencies, the East Asian exporters and Persian Gulf oilies have permanently forestalled balancing their external accounts by accepting cheaper and cheaper dollars as prescribed by Texas-style monetarism, thereby retaining their export surpluses, the mercantilist exporters have accumulated treasury bonds from the backhaul. Accordingly, the nine trillion of current global forex reserves, mostly held by the aforementioned peggers, are not monetary reserves in any meaningful sense. They are effectively vendor-financed export loans and they are what make the present economic world go round. They are also what made the U.S. balance sheet go parabolic. For a century after the resumption of convertibility in 1879, the ratio of total U.S. debt, both uh, private and public, to national income was remarkably stable. Despite cycles of war and peace and boom and bust, this national leverage ratio oscillated closely about around 1.6 times. Call this remarkably stable ratio of total debt to national income the golden constant. Note further that after the events of August 1971, this heretofore stable uh, ratio, uh, national leverage ratio, broke out to the upside and never looked back. By the middle 1990s, it had reached 2.6 times and then soared to 3.6 times national income by 2007, where it remains. Stated differently, we have added two full terms of, two full turns of debt on the national income since 1980, an outcome which amounts to a nationwide LBO. Now, the volume of incremental debt now being lugged about by the national economy owing to this debt spree is startling. In round dollar terms, total credit market debt would currently be 22 billion under the golden constant, i.e. 1.6 times 14 and a half trillion of GDP. But today it is actually 52 trillion or 3.6 times. Now Wall Street bulls and Keynesian economists to indulge in a redundancy, insists that this extra 30 billion of debt is no sweat. Presumably, they would otherwise not be forecasting 10 years of standard growth with no recession and would not be capitalizing corporate earnings at the conventional 15 times EPS. Put another way, by the lights of mainstream opinion, our parabolic departure from the golden constant, uh, golden constant of leverage, apparently rep represents nothing more than a late-blooming enlightenment 
the shedding of ancient superstitions about the perils of too much debt in households, businesses, and government. If this were true, it would be a pity. Had our benighted financial forebears only known better, they would have levered up the U.S. economy long ago, producing unimagined surges of growth and wealth. Indeed, economic miracles like the Internet might have been generated at a far earlier time, say in 1950, not 1990. And it might have been invented by Senator Albert Gore Sr. of Tennessee, <laughs> rather than his son, Albert Gore Jr. of Hollywood. Uh, one never knows. <laughs> the alternative possibility, however, is that our financial forebears actually knew a thing or two about finance. Perhaps they understood that in not settling our accounts with the world, we were merely borrowing GDP, not growing it. The numbers, in fact, suggest exactly that. During the era of the golden constant, about $1.50 a debt growth accompanied each dollar of GDP growth. By 1989, each dollar of GDP growth took 250 of debt increase, and by 1999, the ratio rose to 330. After this, it was off to the races. When the debt supercycle apogee came in 2007, it took $4 trillion of debt growth that year alone to produce just 700 billion of incremental GDP. At that point, the debt to income ratio had climbed, debt, uh, debt to income growth ratio had climbed to six times. And shortly thereafter, the man from Citigroup finally stopped dancing, as you all remember. The evaporation of artificially inflated income growth and the bursting of the asset bubbles, which inexorably followed this kind of debt supercycle, have arrived at their appointed time. And the financial condition of the household se uh, sector suggests that the postulated Austrian moment may have a hang time measured in years or even a decade, not months or a quarter. First, the adjustment in household balance sheets to date has been in the marking down of housing assets, not any material shrinkage of debt outstanding. Specifically, household net worth has dropped by nine trillion, or about 14% since the final quarter of 2007. However, only 380 billion, or 4% of this decline, is attributable to reduced debt. The rest is owing to shrinking asset values. So by the lights of the golden constant, we still have a long way to go. Indeed, back in 1975, when America's baby boomers were still young, total household debt, including mortgages, car loans, credit cards, and bingo wagers, were 730 billion, or about 45% of GDP. But today, the far older baby boom-led uh, household uh, sector now has, has shed almost no pounds since the crisis of 2008. Total household sector debt outstanding is still 13.4 trillion, or 91% of GDP, double where we started. It is always possible, of course, that the 78 million baby boomers now marching straight away into retirement will hit the credit juice one more time. But the only household debt still growing is on the other end of the demographic tur a curve. Total student loans outstanding, subprime credits by definition, now total one trillion and exceed all of the nation's outstanding credit card debt. We've seen this movie before and it doesn't end happily. If in the future households have to earn, not borrow, what they spend, that 3.5% assumption about money GDP growth might look uh, a lot more plausible. The fact is, organic income is not growing at even 3%. A shocking point buried in the statistics of our government medicated recovery is that since, Q, since the Q3 208 meltdown, personal consumption spending is up by 400 billion, or nearly 4%. But private wages and salaries are still 100 billion or 2% below where they were before the plunge. Again, these figures are in nominal, not deflated dollars. Looking at the data since 1950, you can't find a period in which private money wages were down for even three months, let alone nearly two and a half years. <laughs> 
Consequently, we have been able to keep up the appearance of consumption spending growth, even if tepid, only by resort to Uncle Sam's credit card. Specifically, the gap between wage, uh, wages, which are still down, and spending, which is up, has been filled by government transfer payments, all of which were funded on the margin with new borrowings. Transfer payments have risen by nearly $500 billion from the Q3-208 rate. Thus, the Fed and its global convoy of monetary roach motels have been the source of the entire intervening gain in U.S. personal consumption expenditures and then some. When all else fails, of course, the possibility remains that a rebound of job growth could revive wage and salary incomes and get the GDP juices flowing again at more normal rates, rates compatible with a Keynesian recovery rather than an Austrian deflation. Well, as the man also said, good luck with that one too. Uh, the January non-farm payroll number was 130.5 million, a figure first reached in November 1999, 12 years ago. And that is the encouraging part of the story. Uh, way back then, there were 72 million, quote, I call them breadwinner jobs in the U.S. economy. That is jobs in manufacturing, construction, distribution, finance, insurance, real estate, information technology, the professions, and white-collar services. Average pay levels were 50000 per year in today's dollars. A decade later, in February 2011, there were only 65 million of these same breadwinner jobs left in the economy, 10% less. To be sure, this large drain was offset by a 6 million job gain, gain over, in the, uh, over the decade in what I call the HES complex, health, education, and social services. But the 30 million total jobs in the HES complex have much lower average pay at about 35,000 per year, so we were trading down. And their funding is almost entirely derived from the public purse, which is broke. Consequently, the era of robust job growth in the HES complex is nearly over. After experiencing job gains averaging 50,000 per month in health, education, and social services during all of 2000 to 2007, the rate has now dropped to less than 20,000 per month as the fiscal noose has tightened. That leaves what might be termed the part-time economy. 35 million jobs in retail, bars, restaurants, hotels, personal services, and temp agencies. The average wage in this segment is just 19,000 per year. Thus, from the point of view of economic throw weight, not so much. Other than providing intermittent spells of gainful employment for bellboys and bar hops, this segment supports no families and funds no savings, even if it does give Wall Street economists something to count. Now, none of this uh, bodes well uh, for a spirited Keynesian recovery or even a toothless one. Accordingly, the U.S. economy is likely stuck in an extended Austrian moment, and the U.S. government deficit is likely beached in the 1.5 to 2 trillion annual range as far as the eye can see. When it soon becomes evident that most of the 60 billion of appropriations so noisily cut by the House Republicans is mainly smoke and mirrors and a fiscal rounding error to boot, the test of Professor Friedman's floating rate fiat money contraption may finally come. Maybe there is room for trillions more of government bonds to be absorbed by the mighty bid of the Fed and its chain of monetary roach motels. But looking back to 1971, it seems possible that even the ever visionary Richard Nixon did not then realize the ultimate consequence of closing the gold window and opening the door to China in such close couple. At that moment, the China economy, the, excuse me, at that moment, the China rural economy, the only one it ever had, was prost, uh, prostrate under the weight of 45 million dead from starvation and far more debilitated and destitute owing to the great helmsman's economic follies.
By underwriting a 40-year debt supercycle, however, the newly unshackled Fed fueled unstinting American demand for the output of East China's rapidly expanding export factories. In so doing, it also drained China's stricken rice paddies of their nimble young fingers and strong young backs by the tens of millions, willing to work Dickensian hours for quasi-slave pay rates, this army of refugees from Mao's mayhem put the world's wage and cost structure through a three-decade-long deflationary ringer. In this context, a clue to the next phase of this saga may lie in the contrafactual. Had Nixon kept the gold window open, China would have accumulated bullion, not bonds. America would have experienced deflationary austerity, not inflationary bubbles. And federal deficits, fiscal deficits, would have mattered a lot. Thus, today's terminally imbalanced world has evolved at complete variance with the outcome that could have been expected under a regime of sound money. The risk is that the doomsday system for global money and trade which has metastasized since 1971, may be approaching its end game. By all appearances, Mao's great rural swamp has now pretty much been drained. Global wages will therefore start rising because even Walmart has not been able to discover another country inhabited by millions of $1 per day workers. In that environment, the people's printing press in China will have to drastically slow its creation of RMB and therefore its capacity to absorb treasury bonds. Its fellow traveling central banks throughout its feeder system of mercantilist exporters will likely follow its lead. At that point, the Fed will be the last bid standing. But if it keeps buying bonds, Mr. Market may be inclined to sell dollars with prejudice, if not violence. If it stops buying the bond, at what price can trillions more of federal debt find a place in real risk-based private portfolios? Either way, it will be a grand experiment. But as they say on television, it's definitely not something that should be tried at home. Thank you.